Hello, my fan friends. Welcome to another Rahalastapa this week with the amazing and wonderful, lovely Reverend Richard Coles. This show recorded back in November 2019 before viruses had gripped our lives so we could touch each other. What a wonderful time that was. Uh, also before Re Richard Cole's partner very sadly and tragically died. Um, Richard talks about him very movingly in this and it was incredibly kind of him to come and do this podcast at what must have been a very difficult time in his life. Uh, he made no mention of anything at the time either. So thank you to him for doing this. And uh, I think it does uh, provide a lovely tribute to what was certainly a wonderful partner for Richard. Um, I hope you'll enjoy it. It's a very funny podcast um, and <laughs> lots of great stories. Uh, if you're enjoying these, we are doing some Rahala Stoppers in lockdown on my Twitch channel, twitch.tv slash rkherring. Uh, probably on Wednesday nights, we're doing snooker most evenings, we're doing stone clearing most mornings, I'm playing football manager sometimes. We're going to try all sorts of different things, uh, but uh, we should be doing quite regular Rahala Stoppers, which will go out free, live streamed, and we'll also later, providing the audio quality has proven good enough, uh, go out on the regular podcast feed. So look out for those. Got some very exciting old friends coming back to chat to me in isolation. I'm very lonely here and uh, never realised quite how hard it was to look after your own kids all the fucking time. And why did no one tell me that? I'm, st I'm never, I'm not having any more, I tell you. <laughs> Just in case this happens again. Right, let's sit back, relax, and enjoy Rahalastapa with Reverend Richard Cole. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Northampton Deco. Please welcome a man who has just walked down the scariest high street he's ever been on. It's Richard Herring. Oh, thank you. Oh, what a wonderful audience you are. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming along. Thank you. Welcome uh, to Richard Herring's Loafers, Slippers and Toe Shoes podcast. Oh, yeah, we're in Northampton. I know what they like here. It's all... It's a shoe-based. See, everything here is made out of shoes. All the houses are built out of shoes. They just made too many shoes here about 100 years ago. Couldn't get rid of them all. Uh, and now it's just mainly a shoe-based economy. So it's, got to, it's not going to be shoes this week. Uh, though I was, uh, I, was talk I was hanging out at Althorpe Park the other day, and I uh, saw a ghostly figure on the island in the middle of the lake. Uh, she said she called it Rahalastapa. Um, <laughs> oh, look at me shyly through her fringe with her skeleton eyes. So it's um, oh, Lady Diana reference there, ladies and gentlemen. So it's, that's, what's, that's how we're starting. Uh, I, I do like to uh, look up uh, the uh, local uh, amenities on uh, TripAdvisor, if I can. Uh, and I did look up Althorpe House. Uh, I like to look at the one-star reviews. Uh, we went on Sunday to Althorpe House because of being interested in Princess Diana, only to leave feeling very disappointed as there was hardly anything about Lady Diana at all. The Diana walk in her shoes display was hardly anything. Just a few pictures of her, and it took a few minutes at most. I think they were disappointed they didn't actually get to walk in her shoes. That would, I mean, that, that should, does, it does sound like it's going to be that, doesn't it? We got, she had quite a lot. She's got a load of shoes. You can walk around them for a bit. That's worth £18.50 right there. Um, the house is really nice, but you was only allowed in a few rooms. We'd done a, the walk around in less than an hour. We wanted to see Diana resting place, which was beautiful, especially the lake and the monument. We was expecting to stay around four hours, but we'd done it all, including the gift shop and cafe, in less than two hours. <laughs> Felt a bit short-changed. The tickets were £18.50 each, and the cafe was expensive. Glad we went, but not going again. Um, <laughs> I think if you manage to do it in two hours, that is very disrespectful to Princess Tish. They could have stood looking at the island, couldn't they, for a couple of hours? They're very disrespectful to the memory of Lady Di. 
That's why I wouldn't do it. Uh, and uh, I've been looking at the news in Northampton. This is generally the headline news on the uh, local newspaper paper website, website on the 15th of November as we record this. Faulty traffic light fixed near Black and Brack Mills. That is, that is <laughs> that's the headline in Northampton. It was an intermittent issue with a traffic light detector, if you're interested. Uh, wasn't giving sufficient time to get off the slip road from the A45 westbound onto Queen Ellen and Roundabout. But it's fixed now. Uh, your life's a change. Uh, and, um, yeah, I, I, I walk, usually you walk down a high street. It's a Friday night, right? You walk down a high street at five o'clock, you're usually okay. It was the most terrors. There were drunk men shouting, five o'clock. The only place that's worse than this generally is Aldershot, where the same thing happened in Aldershot. I wouldn't expect it in Northampton. Not Aldershot, you expect it. There were the four Northampton Harry Krishnas were out. The four of them. Pathetic. Um, another fact about Northampton before we move on. Uh, Violet Gibson died in Northampton. Do you know about her? She, was, she attempted to shoot uh, Mussolini. Did you know that? I didn't know about her. She shot him in the nose. He just moved his head at the last minute. And she came to Northampton and died. Jerome K. Jerome died in Northampton. He was killed by Northampton. He was on his way somewhere else. <laughs> uh, and uh, uh, the only MP for Northampton to become Prime Minister, Spencer Percival, was assassinated. He's also the only Prime Minister to be assassinated. So well done, Northampton. <laughs> You've got great MPs now, though, haven't you? So uh, it's good. <laughs> <laughs> it's not any mental MPs here at all. Uh, look, we're going to crack straight on. Heart of Brexit country. Uh, well, you, my guest this week, he's probably best known for his portrayal of Henry de Halavand in Holby. That's why we're all here, that's where we saw him. But what's he been doing since then? Let's find out. Will you please welcome the Reverend Richard Coles, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you very much. Please sit down. Make yourself at home. <laughs> It's a reference to something ah. that happened before the show, but that's good. That's good, that's good. I know There's exactly what you mean. <laughs> yeah. I've got, I've got new scamper pants, you know, sort of uh, lounge trousers, whatever they're called. And, um, and they've got a drawstring. And I'm having kind of paunch issues in my late 50s. So the, the drawstring gets caught, caught in the sort of line between <clears throat> upper paunch and lower paunch. Yeah. And it pulls it in. And when it pulls it in, it pulls the seam at the back up. <laughs> and if you're not prepared for that, if you sort of flop into the sofa <laughs> to watch Gold Digger, which yeah. I'm trying to do at the moment, terrible crushing. Yeah, you've got to be careful. It's no joke, is it? No. But, you know, luckily, when you're in your 50s, they're largely useless <sighs> anyway, so... If only... I mean, 50s, dreadful decade for a man. I don't know, I think women probably... It's a slightly different pace of life, isn't it, because of child-rearing and stuff, I think. But I have to say, men in their 50s... It's not great, is it? <laughs> not the best, but... No, it at least... picks up in the... My dad said the 50s were awful, but it picks up again in your 60s. OK, well, I look forward to that. You're at the beginning of your 50s, aren't you? Well, I mean, it's, it's whizzing by, but I'm 52 and a half, yeah. so, yeah, I'm sort of a quarter of the way in, aren't I? I'm five years ahead of you. Yeah. Yeah, it gets worse. OK. <laughs> <laughs> it's all getting worse so far, but... Yeah. Yeah, good. Good to know. <laughs> I didn't know you'd done some acting. Is that, was that, that, is that you? I, mean, I can't imagine there's another Reverend I'm Richard Coles on there. Um, yeah. Quite a distinguished on screen career, as a matter of fact. Because not only yeah. was I did do a cameo, cameo role as a vicar in Holby City, I married the gay ones, but I couldn't remember their names, which is a bit embarrassing. <laughs> um, but I've just done another one. I've been um, a cameo role as a vicar, funnily enough, typecasting. Um, but it was in an Agatha Christie manor house murder. Oh, okay. And I get shot in the first episode. And I had the exploding gunshot oh, yeah. um, special effect things. Yeah, which is actually quite like being shot. Yeah, they... Have they, you had one? Yeah, I think I have had Because they yeah. do quite... They bang quite yeah, loudly. Yeah. 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 So oh, that's two. And also, um, I've reprised my role as the cappuccino kid for the Style Council, which I did back in the 80s. And they've just done a 30-year-on... Film and I'm in that too. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you did you want to be an actor when you started out? Was that the. Uh, started that, out as an yeah, actor, yeah, yeah. I did. I was, um, perhaps won't surprise you to hear that at school I was not a distinguished sportsman. <laughs> but if I could dress up as a woman in Gilbert and Sullivan, I sort of came alive. <laughs> and, um, and so I thought the theatre might be for me. So in those days, the 1970s, um, there was a thing called the Local Education Authority in Northamptonshire, which is where I'm from here. 
And uh, uh, they were very generous. And they allowed for me to go to this brilliant place in Stratford-upon-Avon, which if you're an actor, of course, is, you know, yeah. like Mecca. But um, there was a wonderful guy, there is a wonderful guy called Gordon Valens, who was a pioneer in theatre and education. He invented the Theatre Studies A-level. Okay. B. Um, <coughs> That's good. That's good. And he also invented this vocational drama course where you could go at 16. And I got a full grant, fees and also maintenance at 16, to go and live in Stratford-upon-Avon in this kind of delinquent middle-class teenager finishing school, which is what it was. Yeah. But it was really good fun. So we used to dress up in black footless tights. It was the 70s. <laughs> and Gordon believed in theatre as a kind of tool for social and political change. It was very charged. And so we used to have to go and do Marxist Lehrstücke, but mostly for the residents of nursing homes who couldn't get away <laughs> fast enough when they saw us coming. I still remember these people kind of valiantly wheeling themselves to the door. <laughs> <coughs> Excuse me, but we had to instruct them on the iniquities of late monopoly capitalism. Yeah, well, it's good to go to the old who are the most right-wing and give them the most left-wing theatre. That's, that's, that's where you've got to start. Obviously, if you change their minds, it's not much use. I also I think the, the papier mâché masks were quite frightening for with people who's were waking up and all of a sudden this yeah. awful papier mâché face leering at them and talking about Marxist theory of surplus value. Yeah. I mean awful. they would hope they were dead probably. <laughs> they would hope you were the grim reaper. <laughs> yeah. Well, gosh, imagine that waking up and finding that and thinking that your life, the uh, the eternity is waiting for you and it's not a good result. No. Yeah. Well, that's you know that's what. Religious people think, Richard, that if you, for someone like me, I'm going to be Some, in a hell of Marxist theatre. That would be that would be bad enough. It is. I know. We were talking about this the other day. What would hell be like? We were having. I've got confirmation classes at the moment. What would hell be like? And they asked me, and it wasn't theologically particularly well thought out, but I did say that it would involve crab sticks. Which is, <laughs> uh, I'm pretty sure of that. You like what, them? Left in some curtain rods so you can't work out where the smell's coming from. Oh, terrible. Just crab sticks. Yeah, Just they terrible. are nasty. Crab sticks and salad cream. Yeah. See, I think, you know, someone who's good can't think up a good hell. That's the problem. So that probably proves that you are, you are good. I could think of some really nasty shit to go into hell. Could you? Yeah. And then I'll end it, it'll end up coming on me, won't it? That's the problem. So. Well, you know, comedians, I think, you can't be funny without having... I think, a lively sense of how dark life can be. <laughs> yes. Which is why clergy and A&E nurses and undertakers tend to be very funny people indeed. Yes. That's kind of my undertaker story. Yes. It's my favourite one. It's, well, it's clergy undertakers. It's my friend Judith, who's now a vicar, and she's up in the Carlisle Diocese. But she used to be an undertaker, and she worked in the Fens, uh, in uh, the bit where sort of Lincolnshire and Norfolk meet, proper Fens. And she was called out one night to a farmhouse, two o'clock in the morning, got up, got her mate, they got to pick up a body. So they got in a private ambulance. If ever you get a private ambulance, it's not good, okay? <laughs> and so off they drove to this farmhouse, which turned out to be down this winding track along a fen, dark, kind of miserable, stormy night, and there's this little light in the... And there was this broken down farmhouse with derelict barns and old tractors, and they knocked on the door, and it creaked open, there was a woman's wizened face, but she said, come in husband was upstairs so they went upstairs to pick up the body and take him away and then unfortunately Judith noticed that he had a pulse <laughs> so she said right we're going to have to tell this woman this so they went downstairs and they said would you like to sit down and she went okay and they said, I'm really sorry to take this back your, your husband is still alive and she said yeah I know but it's market day tomorrow and the doctor said he wouldn't last the night could you take him now <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's marriage for you. We're all in it. I've only been married for seven or eight years. An everyday tale of Fenland folk. <laughs> so, Northampton. Let's talk about Northampton a little bit, seeing you are from Northampton. Born You're here. Born here. Your grandfather was a, was a, a successful, then unsuccessful I'm shoemaker. A, yeah, I was, a, I was fifth generation. Well, I wasn't a shoemaker, no. but my father was, and his father, and his father, and his father. So, yeah, typical of the, of, of the county. Started off in... I'm Northampton. I mean, you talk about Northampton as if it was perhaps lacking in cosmopolitan gloss. Yeah. <laughs> but I'm from Kettering. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. And then K-Town, as it used to be called on CB Radio Days, um, 
is, has not a patch on Northampton. I mean, I love Kettering. It's where I'm from, but it's never going to win a prize. <laughs> it might win UNESCO kind of like in need of help status or something. Yeah. 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 But it's, it's where I'm from. And I grew up, and so I, I was born in Northampton, though, in the Barrett Maternity Home. Yep, they're all, they're all from there. And I discovered... <laughs> do you know who else was born in the Barrett Maternity Home? Tim Minchin. Wow, yeah, Tim Minchin. Did you know that? I knew he was born in Northampton. You've read the Wikipedia page. I have Faye Tozer from Steps was born here. Oh, I didn't know that. Oh, she's on the page. You might not be Do you know there. also who died here? Pardon? Do you know who also died here? Well, Jerome K. Jerome. The... Did he die in Northampton? Yeah. Oh, it's just on Wikipedia. Yeah. Um, <laughs> who the other person I mentioned? That oh, lady no. who kid... Violet I've... Gibson, she died here. I found out uh, the lady who, who did the BBC Radiophonic Workshop Okay. Is it Daphne Derbyshire? I don't know. Famous. She died in Northampton too. Does anyone know? Delia. Delia, Delia Derbyshire. Yeah. She died in Northampton. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> hope she recorded a death sound, death rattle. <laughs> <laughs> but if you, that's not to have been the woman who yeah. was the kind of guiding light of the BBC Radiophonic Workshop. I wouldn't mind that on my... Well, maybe not the woman bit. I wouldn't mind that on my headstone. Well, you can't have it. Someone else has already done it. There you go. You've got enough. You've done loads of stuff. Oh, I don't want to steal that from her. I know. Yeah, it looks like that, doesn't it? But I'm, I'm constantly tormented by the fact that I've not done anything. And I'll get to the end of my life and I'll face the throne of judgment. And it won't be how naughty were you, because we all know about that. It would be, what did you do with your life? And I've got, I think, nothing. Yeah. I mean, that's all of us, though, isn't it? I mean, you've at least been a vicar and stuff, so that's got to, that's got to be a... T unless you've got the wrong one. That's got to be... I mean, you've shopped around a bit, even within Christianity, so you've probably hit it right at some point. Well, caveat emptor, as they say. <laughs> Sorry, that makes you sound a little Jacob Rees-Mogg, doesn't it? <laughs> Jacob rees <-Mogg>. No. <laughs> it's hard to know, isn't it? It's hard to know what God's thinking. That's the, he doesn't make it really clear. So well, who can, can know the mind of God, yeah. as the Apostle Paul so pungently wrote? Yeah. So, although he Do you a, have... Were well, you brought up in a religious faith? Oh, but my church. parents are Christian, yeah. We're Church, we're church of England. Church uh, and I so was, no, well, then. Yeah. <laughs> so I was brought up uh, to be a Christian. And I was a Christian until I was about eight. I think similarly to you, yeah. you were a Christian until I was a Christian, then you... Found well, an atheist I society when you were eight. Yeah, I mean, I wasn't a crit. I, I was just, it was just there. Yeah. But as soon as I began to think about it with sort of some independence, I thought it was so obvious that Christianity was clearly a fairy tale. Yeah. And I was in a school choir, and I started the Wellingborough School Chapel Choir Atheist Club <laughs> with, um, with my best friend, Matthew Gamage, who's from Northampton. Does anyone remember the post office in Birchfield Road? <laughs> Well, the Gamage. Do you remember Tony Gamage? He used to run that. Well, anyway, his son, Matthew. Very specific kind of <laughs> Peter Kay act. He you know, goes down a storm in Northampton and tries it in any other town. Not so good. Dies on his arms. But Matthew's my, my best friend. It's yeah. daft, I'm 57, but he's still my best friend. We've been friends since we were little boys. Um, but he was very glamorous, you see, Matthew. Very handsome. And his family was super glamorous. And they lived in Northampton. So I used to come over here on my Yamaha Fizzer, moped, <laughs> JBD 926N. Mm. And uh, I come out into the bright lights of Northampton with Matthew, including this very cinema, which was the ABC in those days. We used to come here. And I know, I can remember, I saw Saturday Night Fever here. Wow. And then there was an instant, I saw Towering Inferno here too. In those days, you could smoke at the pictures. But it's one half smoking and the other half non-smoking in the, the comfort and safety of all our customers. And in, I was wearing cheesecloth shirts in those. You won't remember this. <laughs> cheesecloth shirts. And they had these shoes that were called Crocs, but they weren't our Crocs. They just had this kind of jagged sole, and they were sort of big and built up. I mean, it looked ridiculous. Acne kind of erupting all over our faces, like the surface of Mars. And um, horrible kind of sproutings and things. <laughs> and I was in my cheesecloth shirt, exposing my pipe cleaner-like physique. And unfortunately, the end of my fag fell off into my cheesecloth shirt, which then began to smoulder during the towering inferno. <laughs> and I think people thought there was some kind of bonus, yeah. kind of immersive experience. Yeah, you've invented secret cinema right there and <laughs> there and there. And then they had, um, fortunately, there were fire officers outside who were there rattling a tin as everybody went out, so I was extinguished. <laughs> Very good. The Beatles played on this stage as well. Yeah. Me and the, the Sex Beatles. Pistols. Yeah. Me and Matthew, we had tickets for the Sex Pistols, but unfortunately, they didn't make it. 
there was an incident, I think, and um, Sid Vicious was poorly, uh -huh. so they couldn't come. But it was the county, it was the county ground, wasn't it? You remember? Yeah, Pistols County Ground. Yeah, so I mean, there are a lot of things happened in Northampton. Not that. That's three not that many. In Sixty years. <laughs> <laughs> well, we had um, Errol Flynn came here. Okay. And he actually shagged Matthew's auntie Gladys. Right. <laughs> um, <laughs> well, you know. I'm probably not meant to. I'm probably, probably not, not meant, meant to, say to have that. said that. No. no. <laughs> Thank goodness this is not being broadcast. No, in it any won't. Get, no, no, no. But he shagged half the ladies of Northampton. Yeah. He was very handsome, and he did a season at the Rep. And there were many, well, you know, as you say, not a lot happening in Northampton. Errol Flynn's in town. What are you going to do? Yeah. Well, I'm hoping the same's going to happen tonight. But <laughs> <laughs> having walked down the high street, it's, it's slim pickings out there. So <laughs> it's not, I mean, it's uh, Northampton, yeah. like Kettering, like Wellingborough. It's not dissimilar from lots of towns across the UK. And the story, I'm going, I'm going back 40 years, really, to the 70s. And uh, it, it's, not, it's not been a great... The past few years, it's really suffered. We lost our Marks and Spencers last year, Richard. Imagine that. <laughs> Kettering, too. And there is just something about a town centre losing its Marks and Sparks that, yeah. that's not great. And I think everyone would agree. I mean, I'm sure lots of people love Northampton, as I do. Um, it's really struggled just lately, and there's a big challenge at the moment to try to get the place back into good order. Good. Well, it's, but it is true. You know, you know I, know, I'm, you, I notice those things everywhere. I was with the Canterbury gigs that have just got out, walking down around in Canterbury, which you imagine is going to oh, be a lovely... Boring Loads, old church. Well, a lot of... <laughs> yeah, it has got a terrible church. You have to pay to go in. It's very upsetting. Um, I don't know. I don't remember this guy called Jesus. He didn't really like that kind of stuff. <laughs> I tried to model my life on his philosophy. Um, Jesus didn't have a. But they've got they've got lots of boarded up shops there as well. And you'd think Canterbury would be would be thriving, but you know that's that's uh, it's going to be all okay after Brexit though. So uh, it's fine. <laughs> By the time this goes out, everyone's going to be happy in Northampton. The Marks and Spencers will be back. You'll have a John Lewis. There are lots of. I mean, we've got. I'm involved with Northampton University. And uh, we've just opened a new campus, £350 million project, new campus yeah. in town. And that's, I'm sure, going to have a really fantastic impact. In the, I don't want to sound like I'm, uh, you know, kind of making a bid for Parliament, because I'm not. But um, it, it, it is very encouraging when you do get a bit of something good and positive happening in a place like Northampton, because lots of people, I think, have had quite a depressing time of it recently. Yeah. Can't get Percy Pigs there, though, can you? So it's not, it's not any good. <laughs> <laughs> it was the use of that money if you can't get put. <laughs> but you had to, as a young man, you had to leave uh, Northamptonshire behind, really, as a, as a well, result of. Discovering that you were gay yeah. in Kettering in 1976 did not suggest that a life rich in opportunity lay dead ahead. <laughs> there was a unisex hair salon right. in, in Dolkey's place called Michael's, where you got a sponge finger with your mellow birds. <laughs> and sense that a kind of richer life lay enticingly ahead. <laughs> but it wasn't going to happen in Kettering. No. no, not really. So I, I ran away. Well, I went to Stratford-on-Avon, actually, and then, uh, unusual stroke of good luck, I got run over um, <laughs> by a man in a van, and I got criminal injuries compensation, 2,000 quid, 1980. So, boom, that was my ticket to London. Nice. God was watching over you that day. <laughs> well, I got hit by the man in the van. <laughs> Off-duty policeman. Yeah. yeah. Oh, was it? It was, yeah. And uh, have you ever been run over? Um, no. I've, uh, <laughs> I, one of my girlfriends was run over just in front of me. Really? Yeah, uh, and it was a wonderful... I didn't... Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> but did you see have her that... bouncing off that bonnet onto the, <laughs> onto the road. It is really weird because all the things about everything slowing down. Yeah. And I, I kind of, like, it hit me. I was on a bicycle and the van hit me and I thought, I know that that grating sound as my legs are in contact with the road under a van is not good. No. But I didn't feel anything. Um, and then I sort of passed out. And then the next thing I knew I was in the hospital and I was bantering with the doctor. But the doctor, I think, thought I was just raving with shock. And so we had this kind of weirdly disjointed conversation about will I ever play the cello again? Because I was bleeding from my hand. And he said, no, do you play the cello? And I went, no, it's an expression. And he went, why did you say you played the cello? What are you doing? I didn't, I don't play the bloody cello. I've got a bleeding hand. So it was weird. Yeah. yeah. Don't try and do bits on the doctors. They're, 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 don't try. <laughs> and so you went to London and you kind of, you, you meet... Uh, Jimmy quite early on. Jimmy Stumbleville. Yeah. yeah, well, I arrived... I mean, 
there were lots of gay runaways. There always have been gay runaways coming to London from places like here. But also Jimmy, I mean, I was, you know, middle class, middle English public school boy, but Jimmy came from a very tough working class sectarian background in Mary Hill in Glasgow. And what he ran away from was a much tougher... Than, I, well, I remember, I know, I know Jimmy, for, he's got a wonderful falsetto voice that people know very well, but his speaking voice is quite gruff. And in, in spite of being 40 years out of Glasgow, he's never really lost the Glaswegian accent. He's the only person I know who pronounces French cast iron cookware as la cruzette. <laughs> <laughs> Would you get that la cruzette? But, um, so I didn't really understand the word he said for about six months but when I met him, which actually worked out quite well. Um, but we did, I said, well, you know, eventually when I did, I said, why did you run away? He said that people discovered he was gay. And I thought, oh, God, some terrible story of exposure and disgrace and flight. But eventually, it turned, he told the reason was that he was the only boy in his class who bunked off to watch the Bay City Rollers open a carpet shop. <laughs> <laughs> and then they knew. And then they knew. <laughs> you didn't have to be Taggart. Um, <laughs> and that's how we met. We actually met... Well, we met in Russell Square. Right. Which in those days, was a place where you could meet people. Right. <laughs> and anyway, uh, <laughs> he and his flatmate, Connie, Greek chap, they lived in a squat opposite the British Museum, which right. tells you something about how mad trying to live in London is now. In yeah. those days, you could get a squat opposite the British Museum. And I was living in a very squalid flat, in King's Cross, which was not the glossy zone of enterprise we know today. Well, it was a zone of enterprise, but it wasn't very glossy. Um, <laughs> so we were living there with my friend Toby, and uh, our doll checks arrived one week, so it was fortnightly, and Connie and Jimmy's arrived the next week. So when we'd run out of money, we'd go there to eat, and when right. they'd run out of money, they'd come to us to eat, and that's how we got to be friends. Right. And you, you were, in a, were you in a film together? Yes. Is that right? Framed, Framed Youth. youth. Revenge of Teenage Perverts. The Revenge of the Teenage Perverts. <laughs> well, it was a brilliant... London was an incredibly exciting place to be in the 19... And people talk about Britain being divided now as if that had never happened before. But actually, London in the 1980s, Margaret Thatcher's first government, there she was in Westminster, Red Ken Livingstone on the other side of the Thames at County Hall. Couldn't really be more divided. And that made for a great deal of sort of churn and dynamics and stuff. And so we threw ourselves into that. And... London was also permeable to the young and the poor. In a way, it's not now, because yeah. you simply couldn't do it now. No. But it meant that lots of people came to London, found a common purpose with other people, and these kind of subcultures began to emerge. And Channel 4 started around then. There was a brilliant guy at Channel 4 called Alan Fountain. I don't know if you ever knew him. Yeah. He's dead now. But he was the commissioning editor. And he looked around London and he thought, well, this is a changing city. And so he said, here's some money, here's some cameras, make a film about yourself. So we did. We, turned, we made this ridiculous documentary about ourselves. I mean, it was never going to win a prize. Well, actually, it did win a prize. It won the Grierson Award, actually, Film of uh, Documentary of the Year. Not for the... <laughs> OK. So it was, was going to win a prize. Yeah, it did win a prize. Never going to win, like, an Oscar, but it did win. Like... <laughs> um, but it wasn't very glossy, and we didn't yeah. really know what we were doing. But I've always been really lucky, Richard, at being around when things begin when nobody knows what they're doing. Yeah. And that's good because nobody knows what their limits are, especially if you're young. So yeah. you take risks and do things. Well, you'd be like you in the podcast. Yeah, I took a big risk. Well, what I mean, you just, well, you, you know, you, you got in early. Yeah, no, so, yeah. You're an early adopter. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, but that's, you, you, find, you fall into things and, you know, it's, it, it's chance meetings with people that you click with and work with, which obviously happened with you and, with you and Jimmy. Well, I think having a sort of sense that, you go out and you kind of... You don't exactly look for opportunities. It sounds like I'm a candidate on The Apprentice. I don't mean that at all. Don't you think Pretty Patel is like a candidate on The Apprentice? I think she's more like um, the Borg Queen from <laughs> Star Trek. Because it's her face. Oh, you know, I thought she was smiling, but she isn't smiling. She, that's just the way her face falls into a but sort of can, evil smirk. You can just imagine her in the boardroom, can't yeah. you? Kind of trashing her fellow contestants. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity, Lord Sugar. Yeah. Um, I do slightly fancy her, and that is also... I talked the other week about uh, uh, slightly fancying Katie Hopkins when she was first on as well. Really? So I ha I'm obviously drawn to extreme right wing. <laughs> I fancy the Borg Queen. 
I mean, she's not as extreme as the other two. You, but should, re is... you should really enjoy Northamptonshire. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think, you know, there's something about, there's something about her that's, she's so evil that, I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't, I try to be charitable, but I find it really yeah. hard. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, where were we? We were talking um, about... We were talking about just, yeah, the opportunities. And so... I'd oh, have... yeah, getting in on... So things were just beginning. So anyway, we made this film, and that was what Jimmy and I made Jimmy and I do music together, because okay. we couldn't, we didn't have any money, but we needed to have a soundtrack. So oh, right. I got a saxophone, so I was playing the saxophone, and I said, well, I'll play something. And Jimmy said, well, I'll sing something. And we thought, my heart belongs to Glasgow. You know, but <laughs> what came out was, of course, Jimmy Somerville. And yeah. that was extraordinary. And uh, it was obvious that it's one of those voices that you hear it and you just know that it's a voice that speaks for you and for others like you. And it was just really amazing to hear it. Yeah. And, of course, Red Ken Livingston, to annoy Margaret Thatcher, paid on the rates for a gay arts festival called September in the Pink. And they had a gig, a concert at Heaven Nightclub underneath the arches of Charing Cross. And Jimmy got together with two guys who lived in his then, he was living in Camberwell. And they formed a band called Bronski Beat, named after the character Bronski in The Tin Drum. Oh, Remember the little boy who had the high voice that could shatter glass. So that's how they got the name. Of course. And Bronski Beat happened, and I can remember turning on Top of the Pops and seeing Jimmy and their first single, Small Town Boy. And you realise that this was going to be amazing. Yeah. Well, it's, that's an, inc you know, it's, it's incredible that, that it could work that fast and that kind of randomly. It's, it's, and, and I came to London a, like at the end of the 80s and there were still people living in squats just about, but not really. Yeah. But like anyone I talked to is about five or six years older than me. I was living in a squat. I was doing this, I was in a squat. So it's, it's, it's it, <laughs> yeah. London was a very different place in the 80s. I suppose the comedy scene as well as the music scene was a well, very easy thing to slip into. Matthew, my best friend, was living in a squat in Cloudsley Square in Islington. Right. But I think the average house price now is about seven million quid. Yeah. But, you know, I can remember, thanks to pop music, buying my first house in Islington, end of terrace, Barnsbury Conservation Area, for £160,000 at the gig. Jesus Christ. Well, at least one thing I know for certain, house prices won't rise any higher than this. <laughs> and uh, I sometimes look at it now on Prime Move and see how much money I didn't make in property in the 1980s. But, <laughs> but there you go. But as you couldn't... I, don't, I think no one really could have foreseen quite how mad London would become and how much what's happened with housing yeah. is a consequence of what happened with property in London in the 1980s. Mad. Yeah. And so, I mean, this, so you got into these, you got into Bronski Beat. You well, I used to play saxophone in sax Bronski Beat. Yeah, so I came in really just because Jimmy was a bit miserable. He liked, um, Jimmy, you know, came from this really tough background and a world of kind of restaurants and hotels and poshness was not his world at all. And he felt rather alienated by it. I lapped it up like a pig <laughs> um, and, and have been ever since on somebody else's bill. Um, and he needed someone around who was a friend who knew him. And then it was pretty obvious that we were going to stop doing that, and that we wanted to start our own thing, which was basically we decided to bring down Margaret Thatcher by yeah. doing covers of 70s disco songs. Yeah. <laughs> Where is she now? It, it worked eventually. <laughs> <laughs> so that was the plan. Yeah. Uh, which was an ambitious plan in the middle years of the 1980s. Yeah. I was talking to... This is a name drop, sorry, but I was talking to my... my my pal Andrew Ridgely the other day. <laughs> and, uh, and I remember watching the video for Club Tropicana and thinking, I think you might have got this a bit more... You might have nailed this a bit more than we have <laughs> about what people actually really want in the middle <laughs> years of the 1980s. Oh, man, but it was... It's, I mean, that's, it was, that's an incredible... Like, you, you were living a life of more excess than you do now as a, as a, a, a priest, I guess. Kind of. Yeah. <laughs> so you were a gay less. man in, in the... Uh, I mean, it's, it was a dangerous time to be a, a, a rock star in the mid-80s and be gay. That was yeah, a, well, God, yeah. I mean, best of times, worst of times. Yeah. Because, of course, HIV was the yeah. spectre. Well, it wasn't a spectre. It became horribly real. At first, it was, there were reports in the gay press about this thing they, they thought was gay cancer happening on the East Coast, West Coast of America. And then, boom, it hit us. Yeah. And kind of everybody, everybody's life was transformed. It was a horrible, 
dark, miserable, wretched period. And to be on the one hand doing pop music, hey, and sort of being vindicated in that, and on the other hand having to deal with the consequences of the people who were kind of closest to you dying of these ridiculous opportunistic infections that mm. normally would not, you know, would have been responded to antibiotics in a, in a day, was devastating. And only now, it's interesting because I've started talking about it recently, and um, even with friends who went through it together, only now can we really talk about it 30 years later. And there's some evidence that if you do go through very traumatic experience, like a war, for example, there's a sort of 30-year gap before that becomes right. kind of accessible to, to you. Yeah, I think I, I think I was hearing on another podcast talking about um, you know in your in your job obviously dealing with uh, World War Two guys yeah. dying and telling you stuff that they never told their families yeah. about about what they did in the war. So I I had, there is that sort of similar. I had one recently where a chap came to see me um, about my age, and he had been a paratrooper in the Falklands, oh, right. and he had been involved in a battle in which he had bayoneted a young Argentine soldier to death. And at the time, that had been what he had to do, training and that kind of thing. 30 years later, with a son of his own, he couldn't cope with that at all. It yeah. come back to sort of haunt him and literally torment his, his nightmares and his things. Very tough. Yeah. Trauma. Um, yes. Well, but you know, but that is, that's, so on the one hand, you're having this amazing time, you're making money, you're, I mean, you're, you've said you were taking quite a lot of drugs. Yes. <laughs> Which obviously down the line... Can I tell you... Great surprise. Well, issue. there was this lovely bit where um, when I applied to see if I could be accepted for training, for ordination, there's a form inevitably to fill in, and there's a box you tick, have you ever taken non-prescription drugs? Tick the box. Of course, you know, I was in a pop band in the 1980s, it had been rude not to. So I did. <laughs> and anyway, it went off, and two weeks later I got this phone call. I said, hello. I said, hello. He said, I'm the chief medical officer of the Church of England. That's all right. And he said, I've got a question. I'm looking at your form. And I said, yes. And he said, um, you tick the box. And I said, yeah. And he said, no one has ever ticked the box. <laughs> <laughs> and then we had to have this really weird conversation because I only knew the street names of what I'd taken. But he only knew pharmacological names. So we had to sort of, it was like Google Translate. <laughs> <laughs> the sort of what was on the menu that year. Yeah. I mean, I don't. I make light of it now, but it was. I did. I did have a sort of lost six months, and I know I bumped into my friend Billy the Boxer at Kempton Races a couple last a couple of weeks ago, actually. And Billy, who's now a boxing coach, no longer a boxer, we met in Ibiza in the second summer of love, and we had such a well, he's such a lovely man. But he reminded me that. I'd bought a speedboat. <laughs> but we couldn't remember what we'd done with it. <laughs> and I think it might still be there, sort of rusting <laughs> on some pontoon. Uh, or maybe being used in drug smuggling, I don't yeah. know. And then he also reminded me that I, we decided to go and buy an aeroplane as well. And we went to the airport. But the, we, I remember, and I've forgotten until you remember, we saw a man, but he wouldn't sell us an aeroplane because we'd forgotten to put our shirts on. <laughs> So we had a splendid time, but uh, at the end of it, it got a little bit sort of messy, as those yeah. things do. And also, you know, but pops, being a pop star is a sort of, you know, you exist to live out the fantasies of other people. Yeah. And so, for an escapist, and there's lots of people, escapism was a very appealing prospect in those, and why, why was ecstasy such a big drug on the gay scene in the late 80s. Well, because people's lives were so horrible because yeah. of AIDS. So the, the trouble is, though, of course, you can only do that for so long because you have no choice but to live in reality or madness, I guess. And, um, and reality sort of came back. And then yeah. I had to sort it all out. And so that's... I mean, obviously, the, the, uh, the Cobbinards kind of came to an end. And was that, was, that, was, that, was that a sort of mutual decision? Or was yeah, it... I mean, we didn't... We'd kind of run out of useful work really and uh, also jimmy and i the tension in a double act well you know you've been in a double yeah act. That's... no you're fine mainstream <laughs> <laughs> but you, you will know that uh, no matter how robust your friendship yeah. and everything it's you know there's all sorts of stuff in that that's quite tough of course yeah. and uh, and that rather eroded the necessary goodwill so and i knew we didn't want to break up or anything because that would license perhaps you know a the press turning it into something. So we just stopped instead. We just didn't do anything. And then that became 30 years. 
<laughs> so we've, we're on a pause, which has now been going for 35 years. <laughs> <laughs> well, you never know. Could, you nev- could, well, no, reason, we get asked all the time yeah. to do. But I don't, can't see it happening. The Communards Christmas album. Yeah, you never know. <laughs> Hope you have a very merry Christmas. It's... Uh, so I mean, the, is it? Did it come out of all this? Did it come out of, uh, out of all the, the, the sort of re- re- well, the coming down from the drugs and real and the horrors of the of the HIV and stuff that were, that made you turn? I mean, sort of back to religion or into religion in the first. Well, the first time. see, I was never. But what I think, you know, I'd grown up in it. I was a chorister, yeah. yeah. So I grew up in an atmosphere. Of really lo- of beautiful music, the Anglican choral tradition is without peer, and being around funny, ironic people uh, who were kind of broadly cultured and sympathetic in places in beautiful buildings. And even though I didn't believe any of it, I liked being there. You know, yeah. And and I think perhaps I was intimating that there's stuff there that doesn't really belong anywhere else. And when, I think that confrontation with Tanti, and also my own awfulness too, a kind of realisation of my own awfulness, I needed to take that somewhere. And I just remembered what it was like when I was a boy being in chapel and liking it and wanting to connect with that again. And it wasn't really rational. It was more, it was more like being hungry, actually, and you smell food and you think, well, I'll go there. So I did. And then as soon as I got there and kind of reluctantly heaved myself through the doors on a Sunday morning, I kind of realised that it was homeland, actually. And, I mean, I know there are a lot of gay people in the church, sort of secretly, <laughs> and, and, you know, but it's, it's not something that is supposedly approved of, or certainly that time. Would it, was, was, wasn't that like a, a major conflict between, or well, was that, was it? It got worse recently, really, right. because in those days, as, as you say, I mean, it's very interesting, if you look at... If I look at the lives of some of my predecessors, at F- I'm the 59th vicar of Finden. The first one we know of was Geoffrey, who was in 1217. Right. But you kind of can see in those lives, they're not that different from my life. And I think the church has perhaps always been a place where certainly gay men, although that word didn't exist in those days, they wouldn't have thought of themselves as that, but no. certainly people who were romantically, erotically, sexually attracted to other men would have found a billet there. It's a place where you could be single uh, without inviting suspicion. It's a place where you could dress up and have a lovely time. Yeah. Thank you very much. Have some of that. Um, and it's also a place, I think, which I think was quite good for people who maybe suffered. And I think for lots of gay men, actually probably more in the 19th and 20th centuries, really would have suffered terribly because yeah. it was such a hostile world. And the penalties, if you were caught, were horrendous. I mean, yeah. there was a terrible persecution of Game in the 1950s, which was run mostly by Hugh Cudlip at the Daily Mirror, a campaigning journalist. But what he chose to campaign about is not something that would, um, I think, would horrify lots of people now. But I grew up at the t- I grew up, when I first came to London, there were sort of gay men who used to hang out with there, who'd lived through that period, who had lived in fear. I, 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 I dated a chap for a while who had been given aversion therapy. So he grew up in Essex and his parents were religious. And anyway, he was, I think, caught having sex with another bloke when he was a teenager, 16. And he was given aversion therapy, which involved having electric shocks applied to his penis while he looked at uh, gay porn. And uh, it's not great. No. No. And also, you know, the church, we have a long history of being unable to cope with human sexuality that doesn't conform to the very narrow parameters we set for it. So, you know, married couples, on you go. Somebody, when I was in Edinburgh this year, doing the Edinburgh Festival, and I was on my way to the venue, and a bloke came up to me and went, excuse me, father. And I said, yes. He said, can I just tell you something? And I said, yes. He said, I really like shagging. <laughs> <laughs> Is that okay? And I said, well, you shag as much as you like. If you could just do it with one other person, that would be preferred. <laughs> but, OK, thanks, me. And off he went. Um, but so we're not very good with all that. He said I can shag. <laughs> okay. But we're not very good with all that. No. All that. Sexuality, because it threatens fundamentally kind of power relationships and power structures that we've been yeah. implicated with for a long time. But it's also been a place which has got, I think because of that, perhaps, it's also had a hinterland in which people could 
live and meet other people and start to live. Jesus said, I want you to live life in its fullness. And the church so often offers people less than that. But occasionally it has been a place where people could live a life that was full. Hurrah. Mm Mm-hmm. I mean, but not all Christians think that, though. That's, that's, no. that's a lot of the people. It might be even within the clergy that it's more accepted than it would be amongst the, the And it has got worse lately because really it's, become, it's become a sort of point of contention within, the ch- within church politics. So in the Church of England at the moment, um, there is a, a kind of conservative, usually evangelical movement within the church. In fact, the venue we're in now um, was for, for many years part of that movement on the Church of England, but the Jesus Army, as you yeah. know, were based here. And that was, um, it's a very vigorous and a very vivid and a very committed form of Christianity. But it's allied to a highly conservative social, um, set of social doctrines. And, uh, and that's the ascendant, uh, ascendancy within the Church of England at the moment. So the broad liberal tradition of the, of, in which people could find in the Church of England's kind of fuzziness sufficient room to live and be human, that's a bit under threat at the moment. In fact, it's worse now than it's ever been. Right. And it used to be the love that dare not speak its name, and so people would just quietly let you get on with it and turn a blind eye. But now that's become explicit, and because of that, we've got juridical about it. So it's quite tricky at the moment. Yeah. But, you know, it will be fine. Don't hold your breath, but it will be <laughs> fine. Well, I hope so. And I've never, it's never been a problem for me. I no. mean, I've lived very happily with my partner. We've been together for 12 years. He's a priest also. And uh, I've never for a second thought that that would be anything uh, that would bother God in the least. As, you know, as long as it doesn't, uh, that's the, we will, you'll only find out at the end, won't you? <laughs> I go, sorry, Richard, you, know, you got actually, it wrong. Actually, I made loads of gay people, but I don't like them. Yeah. <laughs> we're always really clear about it. <laughs> but you with your fancy book learning. <laughs> but this, I mean, in, you know, I, 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 I'm fascinated by Christianity and all religion, but the reason Christianity works as a religion uh, is A, maybe because it's true, and B, because it's, you can interpret it how you want to interpret it. So Jesus is sort of all things to all men, isn't he? And so no, you can... No, actually. No? I mean, I think... No, I think you're wrong. I think he's quite like me. I think he's just a kind of guy hanging out T- think, cracking wise, well, I think getting his feet washed by hot prostitutes. That's the kind of that's. I think what we do now, and it's very much a condition of us being modern people living now, is that we tend to create Jesus in our own image. Yeah. So lots of people I know who are liberal lefties kind of think of him as a sort of freedom fighter and as someone who stood up for the poor and the weak. And he was all those things, but he was lots of other things too. And so the idea that and the right, you know, people on you know people on the right will quite happily. Uh, profess a Christianity that they and they think that you know Christianity is the transcendent version of their worldly politics. Of course, it's not when people say, "What would Jesus do?" The answer is always not what you think, <laughs> because we create the Jesus to suit our own uh, yeah. prejudices and opinions and beliefs and commitments. And he's not that; he's elusive and he doesn't satisfy that. Well, a lot. I mean, I think, but again, a lot of people hold up religion as a way to excuse what they want to do rather than the other way around. I think when you see pro- the Christians in America who are supporting Trump, you kind of go, yeah. oh, okay, so it was never about any of the things you said it was about because you're, you're happy to ignore all the things that Trump's doing that were against, the, the opposite of what you said 10 years ago. It was, it was about maintaining the status quo. And I, I was, for me, I think the mark, hallmark of authentic Christianity is the ping that comes back that's counterintuitive and doesn't tell you what you want to hear. Mm-hmm. Because I think, you know, that our job... The irony for me as a priest, and it will not surprise you to hear that I'm not someone who withers in the spotlight, <laughs> let's put it that way, um, and there's plenty of opportunity for an attention-seeking person in this job. But the irony is, is that the minute you get it right, the minute you realise it's not about you, and that your job is... There's a, pre- a prayer that we pray when we're getting ready before we celebrate the Eucharist, and it's from John the Baptist. We must decrease that he may increase. So if we do our job properly, there's no credit to us at all. Sure. We're simply not getting in the way of uh, God doing God's thing. Is it possible for a Christian to be so good that they become better than Jesus? Because <laughs> that's what I'd be aiming for, like to get up there and go, yeah, mate, you, but you did it better than I did. Yeah. You can come and sit up here next to God. I mean, I applaud your ambition. Yeah. But I... <laughs> We want to point out that you do have a handicap in that you are not divine. No. Jesus has that advantage, you see. So, uh, um, Maybe, but you would, what if I am him returned again? 
Well, that would be very interesting. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm certainly watching this glass of water very closely now you've said that. Um, uh, the, the one thing I'm certain about, that if Jesus did come again, we wouldn't spot it. No. The church would be the last to spot it. <laughs> We would be, you know, you read all this interesting. It's like when you're young and you read something or you, know, you read Bible or whatever it is, you read yourself as the hero of the story. In your 50s, you realize the high priest, the Pharisee, the one who didn't get it, Pilate. Those are the characters that all of a sudden begin to live on the page. And you think we would have missed it because it's not what we think it will be. You know, mangers, stables, dusty little corners of the Roman Empire in the first century. No one thought anything was going to happen there. And it did. No, he's, well, it's, you know, he's an interesting guy, that Jesus, I'll give you that. I've d- I did a... <laughs> I, did. I will I report back to the Archbishop of Canterbury with that. I'm, you know, I'm fascinated by him. I think the, the coolest thing about him, if it's all true, is he's the only person in heaven with a body, so you can't, you can't argue you with can't that. You can't argue with that. That is true. pretty good, because if I, well, the worst thing about heaven for me is no body. That's well, my favourite bit about being alive. Depends what you mean by body. Uh, angels... He's up there. He, went, he got carried up there and his body, he's got his whole body. Well, of course, there's also a tradition that Mary was assumed body and soul. Oh, yeah. But also angels are corporeal, but they don't have genitals. Yeah. Maybe it's genitals you're thinking well, of. Well, I don't want to lose... That. That's my main thing. From what you were saying in the I beginning. I think it's a shame... <laughs> It's a shame that has to go. From what you were saying at the beginning, you sound like you've practically lost it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> and there's another man in his 50s. Boy, could I relate to that. Maybe. <laughs> The bit I like about the... It's very hard to work out the real Jesus, even from the New Testament, right? Because it's written by his followers. Yeah. Uh, and there's all the stuff's pretty... Uh, all the stuff he says is, is pretty hard to argue with, right? But it's hard to get to the, the nub of who he is. But there's that bit, and I mentioned it in Christ on a Bike, my show, where his enemies describe him as a wine-bibber and a friend of publicans and sinners. Yeah. You kind of go, that's got... They wouldn't have... That's snuck into the Bible. That bit's definitely... Is, is, they de- People definitely said that about him, so I think he definitely yes, he liked to drink. Yes, he would have been a scandalous definition. and outrageous figure. And to, you know, he was a Jew, and he would have been born into a world in which Jews would have found it utterly incredible that someone would associate with Samaritans, with prostitutes, mm-hmm. with tax collectors, hated tax collectors. And yet if you look at this kind of ragtag and bobtail that were his first followers, you have Matthew, who was a tax collector, and Simon the Zealot. It's like having Pretty Patel and Jeremy Corbyn yes. in the cabinet, if you see what I mean. And he literally had a Judas in amongst them as well. Oh, That's mind you, watched out for that. that was a clue, wasn't it? <laughs> in a hung parliament, perhaps he will have Pretty Patel and Jeremy <laughs> Corbyn in the same cabinet. Anyway, I could talk to you about religion all uh, night. I know, as the and, theatre slowly empties. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's, but, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a, obviously a fascinating uh, change in your life, right, to go from being a pop star to being a broadcaster and vicar and See, priest. It's, not to me. No. It's just what happened. Yeah. I mean, it's funny, it's only when I've written about it and thought about it and talked about it that I've realised that my CV does look like the work of a fantasist. <laughs> and that if it landed on my desk, I'd just think, this guy's not, you know, doesn't sound real. Yeah. But it is just what happened, you know? Yeah. Well, your life's quite weird, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I don't think it's my life's real, though. I think I'm a character in a video game. So, uh, <laughs> being controlled by a teenager... He doesn't like me very much. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> he's trying to make it all come out. Just like give me hope, and then just slightly Dash crush it. it. Yeah. Um, but well, let's quickly talk. We've got probably another ten minutes, uh, so let's talk about. Uh, well, you've inspired two uh, literary or f- fictional figures. Yeah. So you've, you're the inspiration for Rev. Yeah. Uh, which was a very popular sitcom. So were you literally the? Well, people have said so. I mean, they know the a bit, a little bit, but the yeah. person, Adam Smallbone, who's the name of the, uh, the priest in it, played by Tom Hollander, who's a wonderful actor, is a bit me. But Tom came to spend some time with me to sort of see what my life was like. And uh, it's really interesting because there's the stuff that I told him about that he used, but it was the stuff I didn't realise I was doing, which ended up in the character. For example, I used to pont cigarettes from homeless people. <laughs> <laughs> And then the end, he's here, buy your own vicar. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I used to pawn cigarettes from home because I don't smoke, right? So I used to, and then have a polo and then go back to work. And that, that ended up in the character. And, um, and the bit with the builders, that was my life. Right. I used to walk past these builders. I was in Boston, in Lincolnshire. He thought Northampton was bad. Um, 
And there were these built on building site. And every time I went past in the dog collar, they went, way at the arse, sticker, woo! <laughs> this kind of thing. And, go, yeah. and then my last day, and I know I was leaving, I walked past my dog collar, and they went, woo! And I turned around and said, why don't you fuck off? <laughs> <laughs> and that made it into the, yeah. into the show. Yeah. And the other character is Tom in Bridget Jones. Yeah. Yeah, Helen Fielding is a good friend of mine. Right. And when she was writing... Uh, the Bridget Jones stories, which were originally a column in a newspaper. Yeah. Um, we, were, we were very close at the time. And then, it's not just me, it's, but it's a bit of me and a bit of other people too. The, the bit that didn't have the nose job is me. Right. Because uh, <laughs> um, as you can see, I haven't had a nose job. Um, well, if you have, it must have been terrible before. <laughs> <It's> terrible. <laughs> I know. Don't go to Hungary. How did I have my teeth done? Yeah. Very They're looking good, the teeth. Thank look you. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but that was in um, Stanford. Um, yeah, so I, I have these kind of figures that are vague bits of me have yeah. appeared in things. And so let's talk a little... Well, because also, you, because you're a, you're a broadcaster and therefore in the modern world that means you're a celebrity and that means you've done lots of these celebrity things. Obviously, oh. we'll talk about Strictly. Oh, I love them, yeah. So we, you're, you're Strictly and I, I, did, I don't watch... My mum and dad love Strictly. I, I didn't watch Strictly. I didn't watch your Strictly, but I did find it on <laughs> online today that and, must have uh, been a very intense search well, indeed because it, was, it wasn't for very long it, you did the you did the worst pass doble in the history of not just the uk but, but the, the whole world, world of strictly it's the worst the lowest score for a pass doble in strictly in any international format yeah <laughs> i mean i'm i'm glad there wasn't a worse one because i watched it today and it would be I'd feel sorry for it. It was very really bad. It was like, but it's I sort of fascinating. I, was, it's I thought I was going to be good. Yeah. I honestly did. I thought that there was a Justin Timberlake waiting to be discovered, but yeah. there wasn't. But I, and to discover that live in front of 10 million people is a... But you did well the first week. You were on two weeks, right? Or you do three, three weeks. Three weeks. <coughs> yeah. But they, it was just... Well, it was, an odd, choice. It was an odd choice of costume, though, I think. Which, that's the thing. I well, it was meant to be costume. Flash Gordon, though. Well, it, it was pr Private Eye pointed out I looked like Theresa May, yeah. which is um, <laughs> unfortunate. You know, I was at this do when it was, I was with Johnny Peacock, who was in my years, Paralympian athlete, who was adorable. And Johnny and I, it was the Pride of Britain Awards. Uh, and anyway, we were doing a little dance, and there was a tap on my shoulder, and this woman said, oh, hello, I really like you on Strictly, I voted for you, and it was Theresa May. <laughs> <laughs> so get more, another example of her fine judgment. Um, <laughs> can I tell you my Strictly story? We've got time. Yes, of course. Oh, well, when I was chosen to be in it quite early on. There was this kind of mysterious meeting I had to go to in a hotel. And there were the Strictly people there. And they said, would you like to be a contestant? And I thought about it for about a fourth of a second and said, yes, please. Um, but then I had to keep quiet about it because it's announced in August. And I remember the day it was announced particularly because it happened to coincide with my free colonoscopy at Kettering General Hospital. <laughs> because you get one at 55. So oh, I, I turned that. up at Kettering General and uh, to the endoscopy unit and there I was led in and everything and it had just been in the paper that morning I was doing one show in the evening <laughs> and uh, I got into the gown and the doctor was there and these two nurses and he shoved up the colonel thing and, uh, and then he said do you want to watch this and I went well hours till pointless yes put it on so <laughs> the nurses turned round the monitor to reveal my lower intestine and then, then they both went da 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 You've got to love nurses, haven't you? Hey. <laughs> so I remember that. Yeah. And I loved... It was great fun. I yeah. adored it. And my dance partner was just lovely, Di. And also, I really liked the spray tan. <laughs> um, I'd never had one before. And uh, I, used to, I liked it so much, I went through twice one week, but I came out looking like a conker. Um, <laughs> but I'm quite good on it now. So I was having um, a cup of tea. I was in Uppingham with the Archdeacon of Oakham, like you do. And there were... And the lady walked past, and he said, oh, she's been on the holidays. And I went, no, Venetian, double dark. <laughs> <laughs> have you had a spray tan? I've never had a spray tan. I had a girlfriend who used to have spray tans, and she just leave, just the sheets well, yeah. would, in the morning, looked pretty bad. You have to get brown sheets, the duration yeah, is strictly. And the other thing is glitter. It's a good piece of advice. Get brown sheets anyway, just in case. <laughs> Especially as we get older. <laughs> as you get older. But also the glitter. Yeah, I mean, for weeks afterwards, little bits of glitter. I mean, the, I remember the dog got glitter in its fur. I mean, I had to get all that out. And, uh, and it's really good fun. And then brutally, 
you're booted out. Yeah. And you're just given a bunch of flowers. They call them the death flowers. <laughs> and then you get in a car and you're driven away. And the, the, the excruciating thing is, so you're booted out, and then they, the Sunday show is actually filmed immediately after the Saturday show. Yeah. So you have to go through Sunday knowing that you have been booted out, but you can't tell anyone. And it happened to coincide with the Althorpe Literary Festival down the road here. And I was doing an event, and I had to go along, and it was all full of these Strictly fans. It was saying, we love you in Strictly. I was going, oh, great. Oh, lovely. Oh, we think you're going to go all the way to Blackpool. Mm, maybe not. <laughs> it's not. And then it was, because I got back to the parish, and of course all the children at school had done a special Strictly thing, and the florist had done a themed window, and it all had to tragically be taken down. <laughs> and, uh, and there were some people go quiet when I walked in the co-op, that sort of thing. Oh. So... There are worse things than making a fool of yourself. Well, I don't think you did make a fool of it. It's, it's, but it's, it's, that's part of it, right? I mean, there's some people who are on there as well that, we, that you know are not going to go on to win it. And so when, when it's... Did you I think th you were going to win it? I thought I could. Oh, my, I remember my agent said to me, he said, you're not going to win it. And I remember thinking, well, I might win it. <laughs> <laughs> so I re And, uh, you know, I wasn't going to win it. No. Do you know the other thing about dancing? It's really hard. I just, I, I look at it every, you know, I do watch the things. I think, how, you know, you've got you know, to do that in a week. You've got to remember all that stuff. Just, just the things like, just you can remember where your feet are meant to be, but you've got to remember where they're meant to be next. Yeah. And that's the really hard thing. And the dance of the pros, it's so wonderful. I mean, the artists and the athletes, they live this incredibly disciplined life. And they're just adorable. They're so much fun. And we had... Everyone got on incredibly well except one. Um, and, um, <laughs> and we had a lovely time. Yeah. And the curse of Strictly didn't hit you, didn't end up getting straight and well, getting, getting off with your The your fact partner. is, Strictly is far more intimate than sexual intercourse. Yes. So the, the idea that somehow it's a progression to go to having sex with your partner after you've danced with them, it's, it's much more it's intimate than the dancing step. thing. Yeah. I had a, there was a hilarious comedy moment when we were filming, uh, doing the big painting challenge at the time, which was a BBC One programme we used to present. And we were filming that at the same time as doing Strictly, but it was in Scotland. So you used to have to do Strictly. They'd get on the Caledonian sleeper, shedding glitter, and uh, leaving spray tan on its sheets, and then take the sleeper train to Glasgow. And one, after a punishing American smooth, I think it was, um, my back gave out. And by the time I got to Glasgow, I couldn't straighten up. I was at that, literally at 90 degrees, and I only had my pants on. And they had to get me off the train, like a piece of awkward cargo. <laughs> and, and I literally couldn't move, and they was covered in a blanket. Remind you know where Norman Tebbit was taken out of the Grand Hotel? It was a bit like, sorry, tasteless comparison. <laughs> but it wasn't a good look. No. And they had to get a physiotherapist to come who practically sort of jumped on my spine until it straightened out so I could go and woodenly walk across um, a set doing yeah. something ridiculous. No, it's hard. It's a hard... I don't, I don't think so I... So much fun, though. Was it? Oh, so yeah. much fun. You have... There's a lovely man called Billy, and you get sewn into your costume, and he has to take you to the lavatory because you need a bit of help to get to get it where you need it to be. Yeah. And like really weird at the age of 55 being taken to the lavatory by <laughs> someone. And he was just lovely. He could do last-minute repairs, and he would brush the soles of your dance shoes. And they sort of treated you like proper dancers, which um, some people were brilliant. I mean, Aston Merigold, in my was just dynamite. And Joe McFadden who he and I become really good friends, who won it. Just, I, I, second day, I looked at Joe and I thought, you could win this, and I put a bet on. I got, I won £2,800. Wow. Not meant to happen, it's illegal apparently. But oh, I did, yeah. <laughs> so what you're saying is you threw it. You, you, you could have won it, but you thought, I'll throw this so I can win the money. It did very slightly sweeten the bitter pill yeah. of defeat. <laughs> so but also, I wouldn't do it, I mean, now... I've done, I did MasterChef, which I love, but I did quite well in that until yeah. and, um, little Jimmy Osman knocked me out with Andy Williams' chicken pot pie. Um, <laughs> that was so much fun. So the, the thing about if you do, have you ever done one? If you do them, uh, the other thing is a vicar. V you know, vicars have always been in the knobbly knees. We're always doing things like that, so I don't mind the loss of dignity at all. But it's just really good fun. You get to yeah. kind of play with other people and fantastic toys. The only one I haven't really done, I, didn't, I said no to Celebrity Big Brother. Right. And I turned down The Jungle. But I would do The Jungle if it was the last thing I ever did. <laughs> because I don't think there's any way to go after that. You? 
Yeah, and I've been, I've been sort of, uh, people have asked about the jungle, like in the early stages. But yeah, I, I think it was just the I first trawl. Yeah, 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 I wouldn't do it. I would do it, actually, because I'm not the least bit bothered about kangaroo arseholes and stuff. That's fine. I don't think I could cope with that awful hotel they stay in at the end. <laughs> <laughs> you know, where it's got all, like, the swimming pools there. Yeah. I, mean, I would hate that. But, yeah. Uh, but I don't I like want to be filmed to... asleep. That's, my, that's the thing. I wouldn't, don't, I, the idea of being filmed when I'm asleep is it's, too much. The, the worst thing about it, I know lots of people who've done it, and the worst thing about it is it's incredibly boring. Yeah. So, actually, you can't read anything. You sit around in a muddy, in a mud all day, Ant and Deck come in and you do a game, if you're lucky, for maybe 20 minutes. But the worst thing is, is that the crew are only about 100 yards away and you can smell their bacon butters. <laughs> and you've eaten nothing but rice for days. And uh, apparently it's really dull. Yeah. I'd like the diet aspect of it, I'd quite like. Just to... I lost a stone on Strictly. Did you? Yeah. Oh, well, I'll do Strictly then. Okay. I'm, I'm available. <laughs> um, look, we're going to have to wrap up, but it's fantastic okay. to talk to you. Uh, and... Uh, I'm, I might start believing in Jesus now. I'm going to think about it. My work is done. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, please give Mass Raw the Reverend Richard Coles. Thank you. Go and have a drink in a wee. We'll see you next week. How do you like them sky potatoes? <laughs>